I finally found it. Um, so I've been up here a few hours north of our, our homestead for the last couple of days and uh, uh, I've been tra traipsing all over these, I call them mountains, but I guess the locals call them hills, but they're sure bigger than they are at home. And I sampled uh, 21 trees and I finally found, I found the tree for a canoe build. So essentially what it has to be is flexible, really flexible for the bend. Um, and it, basically a, a birch tree, the reason birch tree works where most other barks won't is the the bark grows around the tree versus up the tree. So if you were to take a piece of cedar bark, for example, and bend it like that, it would just simply crack. So this is a, stuff's pretty much like a cloth, like a heavy f canvas, if you would. But the lenticels don't pop in this guy. So you can see the, the vertical lines here, the, the lenticels. So the tree transpires through those. And they don't pop, the thing's flexible. Uh, it's almost an eighth of an inch thick, which is ideal. Not gonna be too heavy a canoe, but it's, it's a certainly good bark to work with. So I'm pretty pumped. <laughs> Cause uh, of all the aspects of the canoe build, finding a suitable tree is certainly the hardest. And um, anyway, I got mine. I'm gonna get her on the ground and get her peeled. Okay, so I'm at the top end of the of the log I'm going to be peeling, and I've gotten around it. The um, the reason I'm stopping here, I still have about five or six feet that I can use, and I'm going to I have a branch union here, so I'm going to stop at that branch union because I know that's a hole in my canoe, and I I don't need to start with a hole. So um, the remaining part here I'm going to peel, and it will be uh, from this branch union up to the main uh, separation behind me. I'll take that, that'll be my side panels for the canoe. And I've put a vertical cut from the butt end all the way to the top and I'm right down to, I'm right down to the cambium of the log. So now the next step is to, I'm gonna to start to separate this, but I'm gonna do that at, starting at the other end. And uh, it, it's a little tedious when you start. You, it's gonna take about four or five inches either side of that uh, vertical crack I've, or vertical cut I've made. And once you get about, hmm, about a third of the bark separated from the tree, it almost pops off. So it wants to be a canoe and I'm gonna demonstrate how. Okay, so the the bark isn't quite as good a quality as I uh, initially thought. So the, the bottom part of the tree was pretty good and it sort of diminished as we got up. So we got quite a few uh, cracks in it. As you can see here in my roll, got a couple rolls, another roll to bring out. 
Um, we are going to cut a lot of gores in it, and I'll be explaining that when I get to the actual sewing of the canoe. So it's wide at the uh, in the middle, and as it's tapering to the front, it, it's bending up. Well, you have to cut gores in it, so we'll be cutting these anyway. So it's not to say it's not usable, but we're going to have to wait and see. I do believe that's my last piece of sheathing. I'm gonna do a check. Yep, that's gonna do it. So I've got all the all my pieces of sheathing now that are gonna line the canoe that go underneath the ribs. I've got my ribs done. And uh, the next thing I'm gonna be working on is my thwarts. That's a good, good job to be finished. A bunch of wafer thin, six foot long to eight foot long pieces of cedar. Good job to be done. That feels really good in my hand. Uh, so I spent the morning today, uh, both in the forge and the shop, making some new tools. And, and my Mogatogener crooked knife, I, I really wasn't quite happy with the comfort of the handle so I made a new one and I've laid out all my tools here um, that are required to build a birch bark canoe. So the first thing I built this morning was a Mogatogan. So we got the forge going there and put a new handle on that and it feels really good, really good in my hand. It fits perfect. That, that's going to be a good tool. The other thing I built this morning was a, a new handle for uh, my auger which is the only auger I'll use on the whole build. <laughs> Be darned if that piece of wood isn't pretty enough. It could go in a musket, I think, or uh, maybe a handle of a knife. Anyway, it's going to make a fine handle for my little auger there. You need two awls. You need a, a three-sided awl, and that's for pushing the holes through the bark. So if you use a drill, like the auger like this, you remove material. If you push through the bark, you separate the fiber. Um, and it, it has more strength once everything side dries up and seals up. And sometimes to get the um, root lacing through, you need a smooth round awl, which I'll use. You'll see that demonstrated when I get to the bark. Speaking of bark, <laughs> we've decided I'm going to start looking again. I'm just not overly happy with this piece. Anyway, on with tools. So I made a new um, mallet, not mallet, but a drift. Uh, now that's going to be a long way down the road before I'm using that, but that's going to be to drive the ribs into the canoe. You need a couple of small chisels and a lightweight hammer for chisel work. Um, they didn't have saws, you can get away without it, but it does make for a little cleaner surface. And of course, you need, you need an axe. Uh, the other thing one needs, and I have, don't have them here, is I use measuring sticks that are marked. But I also use rope a lot, so that's the amount of, of sheathing that I needed to, to um, span the inside of the canoe I'm building. So that's a measurement. Uh, it's also 13 and a half feet long, so that's the length of the sheathing I needed to line the inside of the canoe. So we got that all covered. The next thing I'm going to be doing in the manufacturing of parts process is making my thwarts. Uh, I make them out of white ash, so I found a really nice piece, a uh, nice clear piece, uh, a bolt that I'm going to start splitting out. But before I get at that, a wee bit of history. So if we think about the, the height of the fur trade in North America, so the northern part of the states and the Canadas, um, at, at the start of the fur trade, natives pretty much supplied the canoes, but it, there were literally, by the time it's in its, its heyday, uh, thousands of canoes plying the waters of the states and Canada, and natives could no longer keep up to it. So they hired 
uh, canoe builders, and they were paid pretty well. French would pay as much as 2,500 livres a year for a canoe maker, plus they'd supply him with the rations that one of the brigade would get. So he'd get his flour, he'd get his grease, he'd get his tobacco, he'd get his uh, uh, cornmeal, what have you, would, and a blanket would be supplied. So a very well-paying job. So they established major uh, canoe building posts. And one of the more significant ones was on a little island called uh, St. Joseph's Island, uh, in the northern end of Lake Huron. And it was an ideal choice because it was in direct route from Montreal to Grand Portage, where all the brigades were traveling. And frequently, Northwest Company um, brigades would stop there. They'd resupply for foods and often change for uh, canoes or better canoes, bigger canoes, as they went in, or smaller canoes if they were going into the interior from there. So uh, there's, a, there's a fellow by the name of Thomas Harrett in one of his diaries. He commented, nearly 400 men ascended from Lachine uh, in a direct line to Fort Joseph, uh, uh, Fort St. Joseph uh, on Lake Huron, and then thence on to the new establishment at Fort Williams. So, yeah, and not only did, did they have these major factories, if you would, for building these large canoes that were required, large and small, uh, they had to store them. And so a wee bit of history there. They had big, big warehouses to store the canoes. They were the biggest investment they had. Um, bigger investment in, in the canoes than they would have in trade goods themselves. So they, they stored them indoors, but natives couldn't do that. <laughs> Nat natives in, in the woodland natives, uh, for the most part, lived in wigwams. And if they were to leave their birch bark canoe out in the winter, it would just be a pile of kindling in the spring. It would rot. So they'd sink them. They'd take them out into an area of water that they knew had a smooth bottom. Uh, they'd put a couple rocks in them, fair-sized rocks. They'd, they'd swamp the canoe. The canoe would sink away from underneath them, rest on the bottom. They'd swim back to shore. And then in the spring, they'd swim out, locate the canoe, dive down, throw out the rocks, get some lines on it, get it back to the surface, dry it out, and repitch it. And it was done at really cold times of the year because they didn't want to put their thing that made travel the easiest was the canoe. They didn't want to put it away till they had to. So it was freezing up by the time they did this swim sink process. <laughs> and in the spring, they wanted to get that fast moving, easy mode of transportation going as quick as they could. So they were swim out when it still had some ice on the, on the, on the water. Anyway, I'm off to build some thwarts. So the reason I'm using ash is uh, this is where the canoe's really going to get its structural um, integrity from. So this, that sort of side impact. So I've sort of got that down to the dimension I want. I've sort of rough described out my profile, if you would, of it. And now I've got to draw that out and get it trimmed down to, to size. 